What a blessing it has been today to be here to worship God in spirit, man, and truth, to take some time off from our busy lives and the cares of this world and put our attention upon the Lord. It's been a very edifying day. We appreciate the first lesson that we had this morning that Brother Dave brought to us. Appreciate the Bible study that the other brother Dave taught us this morning. Appreciate those that have participated in the worship today, leading us in song, leading us in our prayers, and serving our Lord's table. We appreciate all of you. We appreciate the fact that God has blessed us with the chance to be here this morning. I, I echo what David said in his first lesson this morning. I don't. I didn't put together a quote Mother's Day lesson either. Uh, I do hope and I do believe, though, that the focus of the lesson that we're going to have during this hour, I think that many of you who are mothers, or all of you who are mothers, can relate to one of the characters, and I use that word lightly, it's an actual historical person, but you can relate to one of the individuals we're going to talk about today. I think we all will be able to relate to the topic we're going to look at, but I especially think mothers can relate to some of the struggles that the individual we're going to talk about today went through. And I do want to say, as David did, we appreciate our mothers. We are we are blessed. We have those of us like myself that were raised in the church were blessed with godly mothers. Those of you that weren't raised in the church, you had a mother that loved you just the same, I'm sure, and you were thankful for her, and I'm thankful that your your mother taught you in a way and brought you up in a way that your life choices have brought you here to this very moment here today. We appreciate we are appreciative that you're here and, and that you're able to be here today. And so I thought, you know, it, made, it, it kind of works out, kind of balanced out. I believe last year, uh, David and I both preached lessons on mothers. And so I guess we're kind of evening things out this year. We made, I went ahead and preached this year's sermon last year. We'll just say that. So maybe next year, Lord's willing, we'll, we'll, we'll be on, on track. But I think that this lesson kind of goes along with some of the things that David talked about this morning also. Well, at least a little bit, and, and I want to go ahead and get into the lesson. I was, I was hoping Angie would be up here. I didn't want her to miss the opening of the lesson, but maybe she'll have to catch it on Facebook. There was a article, an article that was written. I don't know when it was written. It, it must have been written probably in the 50s or 60s. I'm not for sure, honestly, when it was written. But it was written by Paul Harvey. Now, those of you that are, are young folk out here, you may not know who Paul Harvey was. Let me just simply say, Paul Harvey was a very well-known and influential radio personality. Uh, he was known for saying, and now, the rest of the story. And oftentimes, you catch him near, around the noontime giving the news as well. And I always enjoyed hearing his, his news, news broadcast also. I don't know how religious he was. I don't know what his focus in life was as far as uh, you know, whether he was truly a Christian or not. But he did seem to, at the very least, uh, exhibit some kind of wholesome moral values in his, in his demeanor, the things that he said, and his focus. And he once wrote an article called Dirt Roads. I want to share this with you just for a moment here. I, and I say it's probably written in the 50s or 60s because it's probably when many of us, uh, many of you older folks probably, older than me, probably grew up around dirt roads. I grew up around some. I grew up in Floyd County. You can go up to some strip mines and such. There's a lot of dirt roads up there. But I appreciate what Paul Harvey says here when he says, what's mainly wrong with society today is that too many dirt roads have been paved. There's not a problem in America today, crime, drugs, education, divorce, delinquency, that wouldn't be remedied if we just had more dirt roads because dirt roads give character. People that live at the end of dirt roads learn early on that life is a bumpy ridge, that it can jar you right down to your teeth sometimes, but it's worth it. If at the end is home, a loving spouse, happy children, and a dog. We wouldn't have near the trouble with our education system if our children got their exercise walking a dirt road with other children from whom they learned how to get along. There was less crime in our streets before they were paved. Criminals didn't walk two dusty miles to rob or rape if they knew they'd be welcomed by five barking dogs and a double barrel shotgun. And there were no drive-by shootings. Our values were better when our roads were worse. People did, people did not worship their cars more than their children, and motorists were more courteous. 
They didn't tailgate by riding the bumper of the guy in front, uh, or, or they would choke you with dust and bust your windshield with rocks. Dirt roads taught patience. Their roads were environmentally friendly. You didn't hop in your car for a quart of milk. You walked to the barn for your milk. For your mail, you walked to the mailbox. What if it rained and the dirt road washed out? That was the best part. Then you stayed home and had some family time, roasted marshmallows and popped popcorn, and Tony rode on Daddy's shoulders and learned how to make prettier quilts than anybody. At the end of dirt roads, you soon learned that bad words tasted like soap. Most paved roads led to trouble. Dirt roads more likely led to a fishing creek or a swimming hole. At the end of a dirt road, the only time we even locked our car was in August because if we didn't, some neighbor would fill it with too much zucchini. At the end of a dirt road, there was always extra springtime income from when city dudes would get stuck, you'd have to hitch up a team and pull them out. Usually you got a dollar, always you got a new friend at the end of a dirt road. I really appreciate that article. I really appreciate the sentiment that Paul Harvey had when he wrote this article about the dirt road. And what I get, and there's a lot of things I'm sure you get from this article uh, that we could probably talk about as well, offline perhaps, but one of the biggest things that I get when I'm reading this is he talks about a simpler time. He talks about a time where people weren't so focused on the hustle and bustle of life. A time when people were more focused on family. A time when people were more focused on things that, that truly mattered as opposed to just what we have become accustomed to in our country, our culture, and many of us here in this room experience on a daily basis. Just so many things that, that, that we deal with all the time and it can take our focus off of that which is important. And it's good just to take a moment and think about all those good things that he mentioned there and all the good things that, that are a part of our lives that matter most and not allow the hustle and bustle of life to distract us. So what I want to talk about this morning is a lesson I call, and I'm taking this from the words of our Lord, it is called Choose That Good Heart. This comes from a statement that our Lord made when he talked to somebody who was dealing with stress and anxiety and, and hustle and bustle and somebody that just allowed themselves to get caught up with so many things that they didn't take a minute to stop and really think about what was most important. And that's why I, say, I think maybe our mothers probably have dealt with a lot of this too. I know when I think about my own childhood, I can remember my mom uh, constantly keeping her house clean, constantly cleaning, constantly doing laundry, and honestly, I didn't even know until I got married and got a good wife that I, that I even knew how to do my own laundry because my mom did it for me. Well, she taught me. My wife taught me good. And she's trained me good, I often say. But many of you know what I'm talking about, and even if you're not a mother, those of us that are men, those of us that are young, those of us that are older, we know that there are things in this life that just seem to come at us in so many directions, and it just makes it so hard to focus. When I look at these two images up here, I don't know about you, but it causes me some anxiety just looking at it. How many of us find ourselves, like the four-armed man up here in this picture, trying to deal with too many things at one time in our lives? And when you try to deal with too many things at once, it's hard to focus on anything. At that time. And you can get stressed and you can get anxiety and you can just find yourself stressed out and blowing up like Mary, or rather like Martha did when Martha invited Jesus into her home and she saw that Mary wasn't helping with all the distractions that Martha was helping with. And Martha learned a good, a good lesson that day that I think that we can all learn, and that is we need to sometimes just separate ourselves from all the hustle and bustle. And focus on the most important thing. <clears throat> That's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk to you about choosing that good part. I won't read all this. I was going to, but I want to try to get finished on time today. Uh, we'll see if that happens. That could be my Mother's Day gift to you if we finish on time. Well, we look at Luke chapter 10 and verse 38, beginning where we read, Now it happened as they went that as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now, here we have the beginning of the story. We have Jesus here going into this village, and Martha welcomes him into her home. Just very simply at a glance here, and very obvious to us, what we see is we see her hospitality. 
And one of the things that the Bible reminds us over and over about is, is that is being hospitable is something God wants us to be. Hospitality is a good thing. Hospitality is what begins the story here, an act of hospitality where she invites Jesus into her home. And so hospitality in and of itself is not wrong. Many people have grown closer to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ because of the hospitality of one another. When we have been invited into our into one another's homes for after service lunch, or when we have gotten together on the weekends at someone's house, or when we meet out somewhere, hospitality is something that brings us closer together. But I love how it says here, from a spiritual standpoint, she invited Jesus into her house. So that's a question that we should always ask ourselves: Are we inviting Jesus into our home? Is He invited into your house? Do you do you truly invite the Lord into your house? Is he, and in what way is he, invited into your home? What I mean by that is, is that we need to ensure that every aspect of our lives, every aspect of, of what we do in our lives, the choices that we make, the, the, the decisions we, we, we engage in, the people we associate with, we involve the Lord into our, in our lives. I don't know, maybe some people are afraid of the simplicity in the Lord, and they think that, that by being a Christian and avoiding certain sinful behavior in this life, or avoiding sinful behavior in general, rather, uh, that, that means that there's not going to be any happiness. But that's, I would tell you, that couldn't be further from the truth. You can have a fun, happy life, doing things that you enjoy, going places that you like to visit, having hobbies, at going up and down the dirt road, or the paved road even, and you can still avoid sin in the process. Being a Christian is not a dull life at all. Matter of fact, when you think about the lesson that David brought this morning, you think about those things that we need and the emphasis upon our faith growing and us working for the Lord and us, and us striving to live a righteous life, that requires action. That's going to mean you're going to be busy. It's not a dull life at all. And so we just need to ask ourselves, is the Lord invited into our home? Well, then we find in verse 39 it says here, And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. I love this picture here. I picture in my mind the Lord's teaching. And here we find there may, I don't know how many people was there, enough people that Martha was distracted with much serving, as we'll read here in a moment. But here we have Jesus, the teacher, and you have perhaps perhaps Jesus was, was over here, uh, or maybe Jesus was standing, like maybe I'm standing here, and here is, here is Mary down here on the floor, her legs crossed or whatever, sitting there and listening at the feet of Jesus. It's a way of saying that she was paying very close attention to him, that she was intently uh, paying attention to him. She wanted to make sure that she was near him. She was kind of like that kid that you see in school, young people, that wants to sit in the front row so they can make sure they hear the teacher. Maybe they do it also because they want to, what is that word, brown nose of their teacher. Don't, don't get started on me being that person, please. But you might be that, that, she's that kid. She's that kid that wanted to be up front. She's that person that wanted to make sure that there was nobody in front of them was going to block her view. She didn't want to have anybody try to have a conversation with her while he was talking. She was somebody that was intent on listening to the Lord. And so it says that she sat at his feet. In fact, I don't have the scripture reference up here, but if you read about Paul, one of the things it says about Paul's upbringing and his educational background in the Jewish religion was that he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. Now that's just a metaf metaphoric way of saying that he was under his tutelage and that, that Paul was someone that, that followed him well. I think here it's more than just a metaphor. I think she truly was probably right there at his feet. Or at least close enough that she was focusing on him and nothing else was going to distract her. The question again we should ask ourselves is are we doing that? Are you sitting at the feet of Jesus? If you're inviting him into your home and into your life, then I hope that you are sitting next to the Lord. I hope that your life is planted next to the Lord. I hope that everything about your life, everything that you do and say and think and, and behave is all based upon the Lord. Let me put it to you this way. What we need to do is draw near to God. James says in James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The idea of submitting to God is a decision that you make. And it's a decision that you decide, I am going to sit at the feet of the Lord. 
that I am going to plant myself as close to God as possible. And you notice the result of that is, is that you will resist the devil. The devil doesn't want to be around the Lord. The devil doesn't want to be around righteousness. The devil wants to get you away from that. So the closer you are to God, the harder it's going to be for the devil to get a hold of you. So you sit at the feet of Jesus. You plant your life next to the Lord and, and beside the Lord, and your life is going to change in, in a way that you couldn't have dreamt of if you tried to live your life without the Lord. Well, we get to the meat of the lesson then, and that is at verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And I've, I've often been taken aback by what Martha did, does right here. The very Son of God. He's teaching. I don't know if she interrupted what he was saying. It, it doesn't say. But we know that... that she, he was there and that Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, so he evidently was teaching at some point. And here we find Martha. Martha gets to the point where she is, as it says here, distracted with much serving. Up to the point that she just blows up at the Lord. Lord, don't you care? Lord, tell her. Lord, I'm going to tell the Son of God what to do. That's what she did. I, Lord, I, I'm so frustrated. Lord, I, I, I'm just brave enough to tell you. Lord, tell her to help Tell her to help. That goes to show you what stress and anxiety can do to a person untethered uh, if, if we don't try to learn some self-control. And I hope we can see that as we go through. But here's the thing. Being distracted by serving wasn't necessarily in and of itself what was wrong. Notice the text says Martha was distracted with much serving. It's that she took a little bit more on her plate, maybe a lot more on her plate than she could handle. And that's when it became a problem. She invited the Lord into her house. Many of you have invited people into your home. I was listening to a lesson by Brother Jeff May one day here not long ago, and he was talking about how that some of the best, some of the best <coughs> times that he has had and closest uh, moments with brethren is when he was invited into somebody's home, uh, unplanned, an impromptu situation. He told the story of a time he went to a person's home and they wanted him to come in and eat and they didn't know if they had any food or not and they went in in the pantry, they found some spaghetti noodles, uh, they, went in, they found some spaghetti sauce, they didn't have any meat, but they went ahead and cooked what they had and it was one of the best meals he had because he was able to spend some time with his, with his fellow Christian. And that's, that's the kind of thing that is a good distraction, that's the kind of serving that's good when we're, when we're able to focus on things that will help to build us up spiritually. But Martha became distracted with much serving. It reminds me of how that can happen to just any one of us. Nothing wrong with serving. But what happens is, is when we allow too many things in this life to distract us from the Lord, that's when it becomes a problem. Let me ask you, have you ever wondered, have you ever, have you ever had just so much going on in your life that you just wonder, does anybody really know what's going on with me? Does anybody really know that I have so much on my plate? Have you ever wondered, you know, I'm going through so much. Does anybody really care? Does Jesus care? Does the Lord really know what I'm going through? You might have started off doing something that had good intentions. And then from there it got, it got bigger and bigger. I mentioned hospitality. Maybe you decided that you wanted to be a more hospitable person. But you might have bit off more than you can chew. Maybe you decided to have people over your house maybe too frequently. You weren't able to keep up with the influx of people. I don't know. But we can do a lot of things. I think about my own self. Let me just give you an example of myself. It didn't bring me to the point that I wondered if the Lord cares, but it did cause me a lot of stress and anxiety. And stress and anxiety is a distraction to spiritual growth. Back in 2016, in July of 2016, I decided to go back to college. And I looked back upon my early years uh, in college, my early 20s when I was in college, late teens, early 20s, and I looked back upon that and I remembered that was easy for me. That wasn't a big deal at all, so I could do this. I already had a full-time job in 2016. I was working for the state. I was already preaching on a regular basis at Stone Co. And, and a year later, we'd be coming here. I was already preaching. And so I kind of already had that going. And I thought, okay, I've got this. I've got this handled. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and add something else. And so I decided to go back to college. 
Then I decided, okay, I'm going to go back to college, but I don't have the time to go to class in person, so I'm going to take all my classes online. So I took all, I took four classes online. Later that fall, our kids started marching band back up. And so for about three or four months, we were going to marching band stuff. We were going, uh, pra traveling places, going everywhere. So now I've gone from having a job and from preaching uh, virtually full time and, and going to college. Now I've got marching band going on. You think that caused me some stress and anxiety? You better believe it. I was exhausted and I was more at And I suspect it probably showed in areas of my life, maybe even showed in my preaching. Well, after a couple of semesters of that, I had to drop a couple of classes and go down to two classes a semester. And that was still a struggle. But my point is, is sometimes we might think that we can take on more, and then when we do, we're like that frog analogy when the frog is boiling in the water, and the water gets turned up slowly, the frog doesn't realize it's boiling until it's too late. Martha allowed that to happen to her. Martha got so focused on, on, on everything that was going on, her plate became so full that she found herself at the point where she just blows up and says, Lord, tell my sister, tell my sister to help. So she let these cares get to her. And that can that's something that you need to guard against too. Don't get to the point where you're wondering, does Jesus care? Does the Lord know? Does he really know what's going on in my life? Because let me tell you what the answer to that is. The answer is yes. Yes, Jesus cares. And yes, Jesus knows. There's a song in our songbook on page 466. It says, Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long night weary, I know my Savior cares. Yes, He cares. Yes, He knows. The Lord knows and the Lord cares. I think about passages like Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30 that says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yes, He cares. But I know that life can be distracting, that we can have difficulties and challenges. And when a lot of things happen to us at once, it's really hard to focus. And there's people right here in our audience today that's going through a lot right now. Maybe we don't even know about all of it. But I know there's some of us, some of you out there, are going through a lot of different things in life. A lot of life changes. Some are about to go off to college after you graduate. Some are going to be going into another grade. Some of you, some of you have other things going on in life. And, there, and, it's, and on top of that, you've got other responsibilities. And you can find yourself getting so distracted to the point that you lose focus on that good part, which is Jesus. And you can let the cares of this world choke your attention up. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. The Lord said, Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. So let me ask you this question. Have you let worry, anxiety, stress, anger, uh, just, just distractions in general, have you allowed them to build up in your life to the point that like Martha, you find yourself lashing out? You find yourself questioning your faith? You've allowed these things, anger, anxiety, worry, you allow these things, what you're allowing them to do is you're allowing them to weigh you down. They're weighing you down and you can't grow spiritually. Let me put it to you this way, what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. In Colossians 3, verse 8, Paul says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And here Paul is writing about how that we have decided to follow Jesus. When you were baptized into Christ, you chose a life of, uh, of Christianity, of service to the Lord. And you were baptized to have your sins forgiven. And you were put into Christ. In Galatians 3.27, Paul says you put on Christ. The life of a Christian is, is, is like putting on a garment. You wrap yourself in the Lord. Sometimes, though, we may wrap ourselves in things that are a bit too heavy for us, like anger, like wrath, like malice, blasphemy, filthy language, lying. These are things that weigh us down. 
And these are things that are going to make it easier for the devil to catch you. Imagine yourself running and you're carrying a bunch of weights on yourself and how much easier it's going to be for the devil to catch up with you. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you try to shed some weight. I need to shed some weight, but I'm not talking about that kind of weight. I'm talking about you need to shed those things that are weighing you down spiritually. So you keep on reading. And he says in verse 10, and put on... And have put on the new man who is renewed in, there's our word from our first lesson this morning, renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on these things that don't weigh so much, but will help to build you up. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You know what he's saying? These things won't weigh you down. These things will help you to grow. These things will help you to, to, to deal with the anxiety and the worry and the stress of this life. You see, worry and, and, and anxiety in and of themselves aren't wrong. God made us with emotions. God made us to be creatures that are worthy of things that need to be taken care of. Mothers, if you didn't worry about your baby, you wouldn't make sure the diapers are changed and the baby is fed, the baby is bathed and clothed. You have some worry there. We get that. Fathers, if we didn't have anxiety about making sure our homes were taken care of and our, and our families were protected, we wouldn't do the things that we do. That's not the issue. The issue is when we allow the things of this world to weigh us down as opposed to having some godly distractions, you might say, in your life. These things will help you to run faster with the devil. These things will help you to deal with the stresses of life better. You know why? Because you're focused on that, which, that good part. You're focused on the one thing that the Lord told Martha she needed to focus on. You see, when you have so many things hitting you at once in life, the best thing you can do is to get away off from all the clutter and just focus on one thing. Take a step back. Focus on what's most important. And you'll be able to deal with everything else. And so in verse 41 and 42, Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken from her. And so the Lord points out here to Martha, yeah, you're troubled over a lot of things. And like I just said, it's okay to be worried. It's okay to focus on things. You wouldn't make plans for things that will be beneficial down the road. I'm sure the elders are, are worried and have some anxiety over the project down the road. Barry being the one that's trying to manage the whole thing, I'm sure there's some anxiety and worry about that. But you know what? I'm sure they're not doing, they're not letting it interfere with their focus on the Lord. Matter of fact, they know that what they're doing is something that is going to glorify the Lord. And that's the difference. One thing, one thing is important that you need to focus on. And when you focus on the Lord, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have peace. You're going to have understanding. You're going to grow. And nobody can take that away. Nobody can take away what you learn from Jesus. Nobody can take away the peace you have in Jesus. Nobody can take away the rest that you have in Jesus. And I would like to say, at this point here, is what really brought me to, to think about preaching this lesson. I want to give some props to my wife. Behind every good man is a great woman. I was talking to Angie uh, last week. I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to preach on. She said, preach about the rest that we have in the Lord. And she said that in the context of how that I'm usually the one that's stressed. Yes, I am a hypocrite up here preaching to you this lesson this morning. Because I know that I stress and have anxiety. My employees see it. They have fun with me now because they know that. They joke about coming to work without their badges on. They come to, they come to work. They, they say they're going to come to work not dressed properly when we know we're going to have company. They're going to, they just do that to joke with me because they know it gets on my skin. We all, and myself included especially, need to focus on that one thing, which is the Lord. Let me just say finally here so that I can keep my word. Let me just say three passages of Scripture to you very quickly. Three things that I believe can help us, that can help you when we think about the lesson that's learned. The lesson learned is that you need to choose that good part. You need to choose Jesus. But I want to think about, I want you to think about some scriptures that can help you in, in understanding that. The first one is found in the book of Colossians chapter 3 verse 15. 
In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, the Colossian writer Paul says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. He says three things here. First of all, he says that you have a decision. You need to let God rule in your life. That's a decision you've got to make. You've got to draw near to God. That's a decision. You've got to embrace the unity that is in God. He says that you're called in one body. That's a reference to the fact that the Lord built one church because Paul says that body is the church. There is unity amongst God's people. And be thankful. Do you think that we've all, uh, do you think that there's something you can be thankful about in spite of the things that are distracting you in life? The answer is yes. I know we have problems. The Lord knows you have problems. We know that some of us have more problems than others and more things that worry us than others. But you know, you can go down that path or you can choose that good part and focus on what you can be thankful for. I'm thankful that we're here today. I am thankful that in spite of the problems that we have and that we're going to have to go back home and deal with later on, that at least for right now, for these few hours today, we can come here and worship God together. That's something to be thankful about. Amen. Be thankful about our Lord. Secondly, notice verse 16. In verse 16, he says to let, again, here's that idea of letting, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Here's how you're going to let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I know we often look at this passage about singing and, and rightfully so, but I want you to notice too that the result of this, when we focus on the Word of God dwelling in our hearts, your heart is being transformed by the Lord. Let that be your focus. Focus on the transforming power of Jesus. Let His Word dwell in your heart through study, through prayer, through engaging in, in, in discussions with others, and it will bring peace to your life. And finally, Philippians 3, 13 to 14, Paul says that he's not going to let the things of the past or the present weigh him down and let him press forward instead toward heaven. He says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know what he's saying? He's saying he has the right perspective. And he has the right focus. And that focus is on Jesus. And that focus is like we're drawing up here on the board. It's getting from this point in life to heaven to eternity. He's going to keep his focus on that good thing. And not let the things of this life weigh him down. You know what he says? Every one of us needs to have that mind. Let us all have that mind. Let us all be unified and be in, in that same mentality and so that we can be unified together and help one another get there as we work, as we serve, as we pray. One of the best ways that you're going to be able to deal with stress and anxiety in this life is prayer. If you've ever had a point, a time in your life when you had a strong prayer life and, you're at, and you've had a point in your life when your prayer life needed some work, Think about it for a minute. How much, you, how well you were able to deal with the stress when you had a strong prayer life versus when you did. There's power in God's Word. There's power in doing His will. There's power in prayer and studying His Word. So choose that good part. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I know that there are things in this life that are weighing you down. But the Lord can help you by turning to Him and putting off those things and put on the new man, put on the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Have you done that? And you've strayed away and you've let the cares of this life lead you astray? You can put those things back off too by turning to the Lord and letting the peace of God rule in your heart, repent of your sins, seek His forgiveness. We'll pray with you for you if need be. If you're here this morning and we can help you in any way, let it be known as we stand and as we sing the invitation song. Jesus is all.